from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening and welcome. I'm Ann McLean from the Library's Music Division. It's my great pleasure tonight to welcome Janet Alber, Artistic Director of the Martha Graham Center for Contemporary Dance and choreographer and filmmaker Pontus Lidberg. Tonight, as part of our Martha Graham at the Library Festival, we're presenting the world premiere performance of his Woodland, set to a score by Irving Fine, Fine's Naturno for Harp and Strings. Thank you both for being here. It's very, very exciting for us. Today, the Washington Post has a wonderful headline for the Library of Congress and Martha Graham, The Legacy Lives On. Exactly on the mark. <laughs> exactly. So this is truly an exciting moment for us. Uh, we mark a longtime partnership with the Martha Graham Dance Company that began over half a century ago. It began with a now historic evening of three Graham ballets commissioned by the library's Coolidge Foundation, Appalachian Spring, Erodiad, and Darius Mio's Imagined Wing. Through that astonishing, exhilarating collaboration, the library has established a relationship that has continued to grow and flourish. And your new work, a joint commission of the library's Verna and Irving Fine Fund and the Martha Graham Center, is a beautiful blossoming of this tradition. We look forward to seeing it. And you will be mounting this in New York very soon, right? April, April 18th will be its New York premiere, and that is actually the company's 90th birthday. Martha Graham had her first concert with a, a group a group of dancers, a trio of young women, on April 18th in 1926. So we, we really have a lot to celebrate. Um, we have 180 years, we're going to be saying this throughout the evening, 180 years, 90 for you and 90 for the library. Um, and it's an amazing serendipity. So we'll be talking about our history with you and about the Martha Graham collection here at the library, which you were instrumental in bringing and what that is about, um, and our shared commitment to supporting new work, plus a preview of Pontus's new piece and maybe a quick glance at some of the impressive new ventures from the Graham Company, like their new forthcoming YouTube channel. Um, so let's talk about how this developed, how we got to be able to be so fortunate as to have this new piece. This was just a discussion that took place over three or four years with Janet and LaRue Allen, and we were very, very excited and hopeful when we knew you were going to be involved. Um, and this, I know, is a huge part of your forward path for the Graham Company is new, new work. I wanted to ask you, Pontus, what was the experience like for, of working with the Graham Company? So um, the Graham dancers, just like ballet dancers, have a very a strong foundation, but it's not ballet. It's, com it's different. It's, uh, um, you know, th they are trained equally uh, specifically and clearly, uh, but in a different way. And I'm, I'm rather used to working with ballet dancers. And these dancers came with uh, definitely equal amounts of physicality and clarity in their movement, but coming from a different place, which is, uh, has informed me as a choreographer as well, and it has definitely informed the work. And you, I think, under you studied this technique at some point yourself. Yes. Well, so um, I was a trained ballet dancer, but uh, as part of my education was uh, various forms of contemporary dance movement. And Graham technique was the first one that I was exposed to. But I think, in general, uh, Graham was one of the few who really codified a technique. Uh, other choreographers have a lineage or a style of training, but she actually codified a technique. So, so, um, but most contemporary training is not like that. It's much more nebulous. And you've also commented on the expressivity of this particular troupe, their, their, their facial expressions and the whole aesthetic they... Yeah, th this, this is also something I very much appreciate because they, the company, the dancers have a strong um, confidence in their facial expression. Mm -hmm. There is certain uh, movements of contemporary dance where the face is kind of forgotten, I mean, on purpose, where the, the movement is supposed to speak and the, the, you're not supposed to emote with your face. But these dancers' faces are very alive and I find that very 
um, inspiring and true, true to people. That's something that you, you studied. I mean, I know it, it's a 10-year process, right, the Graham technique, I think? That's what Martha used to say, that it takes 10 years to make a dancer. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, I think that what Pontus is describing is just el the element of the Graham technique, which is that she created this vocabulary um, sort of born out of body language, out of natural gesture, and um, because she wanted to describe what she called the inner landscape, uh, the, the human emotions and conditions rather than swans and flowers and kings and queens, she was going for the, what was really going on here in the, in the late 1920s and 30s. And, and the vocabulary she developed is a combination of um, the core, the um, emotion riding on the breath and coming from the core of the body, and her famous contraction and release, which is the energi energizing of the torso. Um, and it is a perfect marriage between that physicality, the physical vocabulary, and the emotion that it's describing. Mm -hmm. So for gram dancers, they're really trained to illuminate the physical movement with an emotional image um, in the classroom. Mm. It's, it's a marriage between the two. That's an, I You'll see in yeah. Medea tonight, um, um, Appalachian Spring, they, the dancers really have to be actors um, as well as incredible athletes. And even just in their carriage, I mean, anyone who's seen a Graham performance, the way they step onto the stage is like actors in a no theater or anything else, immediate presence and charisma. That's something I always kept, I took away with me from the first time I saw a Graham performance. Um, re thinking about the music, um, watching your work, there's such musicality. And I know you were a musician first. What was your instrument and what made you choose the path to dance? Uh, I was trained uh, as a pianist as a young boy, and um, it was as I remembered it, and I was pretty young, so I might not remember everything, <laughs> but uh, at 10, you kind of have to choose professional training for both mm -hmm. uh, mu music or dance, and I auditioned for both, uh, both uh, professional schools that were available in Stockholm and I was accepted into both and so I had to make a choice then and there mm -hmm. and the one thing I remember is that the audition for the music classes um, were on a Sunday in the winter and you I was alone with a teacher in a room and I was you know singing and uh, kind of they were I guess they were just testing me and the audition for the ballet school was on a Thursday night and it was full of people in the corridors and in the classrooms and on stage training and running mm -hmm. past and it felt like a dynamic place. I th honestly think that that was a deciding factor. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. A and to add to that, uh, I, I know many musicians and they have an, a wonderful rich life and also soloists especially, a rather lonesome life sitting mm -hmm. by themselves practicing. In a, yes, or in a hotel room touring constantly, it's true. Um, thinking about the music uh, for your work, Irving Pine's lyrical Noturno for Harp and Strings, it's very interesting for us to see this work, uh, people who know the work as a chamber piece, to see it excuse me, come into a new dimension through your dance. And this reminded me of Janet's phrase, uh, seeing the classics through new eyes. And I was wanting to, I was thinking too about how you re-envisioned the classic ballet Raimonda. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? So um, Raimonda is a, a work I made for the Royal Swedish Ballet about one and a half years ago was the premiere. And um, it's a classical ballet, one of the classics um, by Glazunov, uh, but um, not that often performed, actually. Mm. Um, it's huge. It's very long and uh, very, uh, a very big work. And uh, I reinvented it by writing a new libretto because the libretto had, has a lot of problems for our contemporary times. It's very racist. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's uh, also kind of is all over the place. It's one of those librettos where you think, I mean, I don't exactly know, but I'm pretty sure that it was written more to be able to showcase we want this kind of oriental dance here and then we want mm -hmm. this and the, they kind of like wrote their libretto haphazardly yeah. 
to suit inspir various inspirations. But I re completely rewrote it while keeping certain elements. Um, and it was kind of coming full circle for me because I was trained in ballet, but I very early chose to go uh, a contemporary uh, path. I felt like there was more to do in contemporary dance mm -hmm. and definitely more to explore. But that that training, just like Graham training, is something you just can't undo. I mean, it's in my body. So mm -hmm. uh, it was interesting to come full circle and revisit that again. And the piece, um, with the music, you, uh, with the fine piece, you actually reordered it slightly and uh, made it cyclical, I think you wrote about well, so, so that I did with Raimonda too, by the way. I, I, I reordered it to suit the new libretto. But with this, with the Nocturno for Harp and Strings, I, I thought that I didn't want to illustrate the work only, but I, also, I wanted to somehow add a new structure to it. Um, and uh, I... So I added a repeat, I, I framed the work with the fast section, uh, the animato, and then I reordered the two slow sections and it kind of almost became a mirror or a, a cycle, both. It kind of goes to the middle and then it almost rewinds, but it takes a different path back. And I found that that was interesting because it, it also talks to Irving Fine, and which I can't do, but I can, <laughs> I can add a comment. It was so nice to see in the film about your work and about this project, which you can see in our lobby here tonight. Um, to, so nice to see the pictures of the composers that the Graham Company has worked with, including now this music for, from Irving Fine. But um, you, you, I guess you found in your archive some of those photos to, to bring out. And um, music has always been a hugely important part of what you do, choosing the music and so on. For us, it's exciting tonight to have a live orchestra. We try to every time to have a live orchestra when we can possibly do it, and it sounds it sounds fantastic. Um, it's a little challenging, and we'll get to the challenges of working in the Coolidge in just a minute. <laughs> Regarding your work as a filmmaker, I wanted to ask you to touch on that and ask you about how it affects your vision for your choreography. Um, it's a question I, I get fairly often. I, um, the first thing I would say is that when you look, when, when I create for film, the option I have, which I don't have on stage, is to completely direct the eye of the audience. I can zoom in on a button, for example, and that is what the, everyone will see. In the f in film, but when you put something on stage, you can't do that. In fact, you leave it to the each individual mm -hmm. audience member to to follow their own path. So you have to think differently about structure, and um, yeah, it, they're very different ways of working, actually. And um, I was wondering, I was thinking about Martha Graham's experiments uh, ex experiments in in technique and her inspiration from the visual arts. Uh, in a comment, her statement on seeing a Kandinsky painting in 1926 before she had even become known as a choreographer in New York, she looked at the painting and her response later was, I will dance like that. It was just an extraordinary comment. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to see, Janet, if you had thoughts on the visual arts in later Graham works and, and today too, how are you working with visuals? Well, Martha drew great inspiration from, well, from such a variety of things. She was a voracious reader. She loved poetry. She, uh, she really, when she saw the Kandinsky in, in 26, or I thought it was 23, but um, it, she was visiting the first exhibit in America at the Chicago Art Institute of the um, uh, European uh, abstract painters, modern painters. And she said um, she was relieved to see the exhibit because she was so relieved to see that there were other people who thought the way that she did, to see this abstract work. Um, and and uh, the Kandinsky had a streak of red in it. She said she would make a dance like that, and that's our dance, Diversion of Angels, from 1948, which is unfortunately not on this program. Um, but she would, when she was choreographing, she would bring in huge coffee table art books with specific uh, paintings or sculptures um, or, or sometimes natural things, leaves and trees that she was drawing inspiration from on whatever new work that she was uh, creating. Uh, and 
uh, you know, it was just one of the many ways she um, filled herself with inspiration before she started to choreograph. And she was also very much involved in Jungian psychology, studying that as well, right? And Joseph Campbell and... Joseph Campbell was married to one of the members of her company. Jean Erdman, yes. So um, that was in the 40s. Eric Hawkins, Martha, who Martha married for a short time, had studied the classics at Harvard, uh, and we, th we think that is why the Greek period appeared. You know, Eric was inspiring her. Um, and after she divorced Eric, she was in Jungian analysis. So <laughs> she was kind of drawing inspiration from all over the place. But the uh, Dark Meadow Suite on tonight's program uh, is a, a suite of highlights from the much longer work Dark Meadow. And Dark Meadow is considered to be her Jungian piece created while she was in analysis about um, life's greatest adventure, the, uh, I'll quote it tonight in our introduction, the adventure of seeking. Um, so it's, it's a ballet about questioning. There's no dramatic narrative. It's, uh, it's uh, about life's journey. And this is something, these areas we're talking about, uh, the, the psyche and myth, mythopoesis and so forth, these are uh, very much in the line of thinking of Isamu Noguchi. And we, as many of you in the room know, we've had the pleasure of having an exploration of the connection between Graham and Noguchi in the past week. It's been really exciting um, and fun, something very different for us. But I was thinking back to the art again, how she took him, she took Noguchi to the, I think, MoMA to look at a work there and said, this is what I have in mind. And then he said, okay, I, I understand. And he, I don't think the, the, the book that I, we were reading, Hayden Herrera's biography sort of says he didn't really want to go to the museum or he didn't need to go to the museum, but it just showed me how much she was involved with this kind of uh, visual impetus and, and so on. And in talking about him, I really got a kick out of reading an article by you where you talked about the challenges of working with these Noguchi set pieces as a dancer. And I'd love it if you'd talk to the audience about that. Well, it was a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but uh, the dancers uh, really have to they have a very intimate relationship with these sets. Noguchi designed sets that are totally practical. We scramble all over them, we swing off them, doors open, chairs spin. Tonight in Medea, you'll see she, she climbs inside this beautiful brass bush of thorns. And, um, but they don't always act exactly as you'd like them to act. <laughs> and for example, in Appalachian Spring, um, it, because Noguchi used the angles of the house to create perspective and to and to to give such a beautiful provocative design to the audience, but the rocking chair that the pioneering woman has to sit on for so long is is about as big as a bicycle seat. You know, it's almost two dimensional. At one point, you'll see the four followers sit on the little bench that's up against the wall of the house. Well, that bench is only about four inches wide, and it's raked. It's, it's on an angle, so they really can't even perch on it. <laughs> um, so there's all sorts of stories. In Cave of the Heart, the big um, aorta that is at the back of the center stage, um, has uh, corners, sort of, we call it the elephant because it looks like an elephant on the back with his feet sticking up. And dancers have to step from corner to corner and look, not look down and look very self-assured as they walk around this thing. Um, and it uh, takes a lot of rehearsal. There's a little bit of swearing that goes on, I think. <laughs> I wanted to, following up on this, I wanted to ask you both about the experience of working in the Coolidge Auditorium, what it's been like for you. And I was thinking about Noguchi's comment that he tried to make our very small stage, which is only 19 feet deep and 31 feet wide, appear larger than it is. And he said, I tried to create a really new theater with hallucinatory space. So we were all amazed to see how much you, Pontus, and you, Janet, and your dancers are able to do with this space. How, what, how's it been for you? Well, we taped it out in rehearsal studio, so I mean, th we, we just arrived yesterday. Um, so I, I only had a, an idea. I had seen pictures, and we had taped out the measurements. But um, So I knew it was small. I don't think it looks that small, though. Yeah, I'm, I mean, it's small, but 
it, it definitely, it's also the room or the auditorium itself has angles, perspective that makes it look bigger than it is. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I, I actually, to be honest, I, I thought that first I need to create the piece and uh, with no knowing that it, it will be here, of course, but I don't want to walk, I don't want to have in my mind that the, that there will be limits. <laughs> um, sure. I rather I created things and then they are mm -hmm. adapted to reality when when needed to, but actually not much needed to be adapted. Well, we're we're adapting entrances and exits because in the, in the Coolidge there's only a downstage entrance on each side, and we're used to be able to exiting in four different wings and. Um, so you'll see sometimes dancers sort of running along the side and then coming in. And um, we did remove one couple from the Dark Meadow Suite. We, there usually have four on stage, just in one section, and we went down to three. So we've, we've been adjusting for the last few weeks to make sure no one got kicked or <laughs> anything like that. I was amazed to see how, how completely at ease they all seemed on in our stage, which yeah. is a, a tribute to what you've done to plan and so forth. There's also one thing to note, that part of the Noguchi set for Appalachian Spring is, does not fit on this stage. Uh, at the very center of the back of the stage, there's usually a, a doorway framed with a beam of a house coming to it. Um, and like Martha did at the premiere, that frame of a doorway is not present on this stage. We're actually using the upstage door that is built into the Coolidge. Um, so, but that's a, that's a historic adjustment at this point. Um, today, somebody mentioned, uh, thinking about Martha Graham and the library's long connection to her, that today is the 25th anniversary of her death, which I didn't know. Um, April 1st, and um, we, we were looking earlier in the afternoon, we were looking at some quotes from her uh, uh, talking about walking the high wire of circumstance, practicing living at the instant for a dancer. Um, she says, at times I fear walking that tightrope. I fear the venture into the unknown, but that's part of the act of creating and the act of performing. That is what a dancer does, venturing into the unknown. And um, I was just wondering, this is maybe a good spot to talk about both, to t talk with both of you about, you each have a troupe, you, you're responsible for a, a big aesthetic vision and um, maybe something about the world of contemporary dance today and what you see for it and your hopes and plans. I know you, for example, I heard you had a big film project with your company coming up. Well, m my company is uh, m more, um, Con realistic for contemporary times. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that there are very few actual institutions made anymore. It just doesn't work out that way. Um, rather, dance has always been very fluid. Dancers have been fluid, ephemeral, and moving around and wanting to uh, experience different kinds of choreographers and cities. So that's not new, but it's certainly been solidify that that's kind of a lifestyle of dancers nowadays. And uh, my company is um, not inst an institution. We come together when there is funding and work and projects. And sometimes that's a lot and sometimes that's a little. And then I also create works for companies such as the Martha Graham Dance Company and, and many others. So uh, my time is, is filled, but um, Sometimes I'm with my own group and sometimes I'm with, with others. And actually that works out really well for me because I get so much more information for my work this way. Um, but yes, I am working on another film right now w w with my company. And we, we, Janet and I talked a little bit the other night about the amazing new paths that you are leading for the Graham Company. Um, and I wanted to ask you to talk about your expanding access to audiences through these innovative ventures. Well, that kind of also speaks to what's going on in the dance world these days. You know, modern dance is a really young art form. It's just over 100 years old now. And it was born out of revolt, uh, each generation rejecting what had gone before and moving forward. But um, as we hit our hundredth birthday or so, um, the, the field itself is, is looking back and say, well, wait a minute, we, 
there are things in our past that we don't want to throw away. It, the art form has new classics, and Graham certainly um, ha has many of these classics. But the modern dance has really not focused on um, how to keep their classics, how to celebrate them, how to keep them relevant, how to um, engage audiences with them. Um, it, the audiences uh, for modern dance really have been trained, and the funders, to appreciate the new. It's all about the new. So um, we've really been experimenting with um, how to bring more points of access for today's audiences to our classic works. Um, everything from simply spoken introductions on our programs. We, we started by asking, well, what's the modern dance equivalent to a museum's audio tour? or to opera's supertitles, you know, how do you bring context to, to the classics so that audiences can enter into them um, and uh, appreciate the, their profundity um, and beauty. So we've done spoken introductions, we've done um, contextual programming, we do season themes like inner landscape focusing on the psychological ballets. Or, um, we've, we're the first company to stream a rehearsal live. We've done online video competitions. Uh, we partner with all sorts of different educational institutions and cultural institutions. And um, our school has many creative projects. Um, and this has all led us to commissioning new work because we believe there's a real conversation between new work and the classic works. And we've discovered by having both on our programs, it's really kind of a one plus one makes three. The classics uh, bring a, a context to the new work and the new work brings fresh eyes to the classics. And um, so that's a very short, it's not such a short answer, but I could be much longer on that topic, I'll tell you. That's the exciting thing about tonight. We'll have this chance to see both the masterworks and a new one. And um, I was thinking back to, just to finish up on your technological innovations, and one of the, uh, but I was also got an, I was interested in your comment about Graham herself and the company have always been on the cutting edge. And you now have a new mobile app that's downloadable, if anybody is interested. And free. Free. Yes. yes. What's exactly on that? Well, um, the Google came to us about a year ago and uh, said, you know, we're expanding our Google Cultural Institute, which uh, you're, you're able to take virtual tours of museums on their cultural institute, and we're expanding it into the performing arts. And we were, you were the first dance company that we have invited to be part of this. So um, we were delighted because we have been spending a lot of time organizing and digitizing our archives, which are the largest dance archives for any single living artist, dance, or not living, sorry, any single dance artist. Um, so we were kind of poised to help share them on the Google Cultural Institute. Uh, and in December 1st, they launched this um, new part, the performing arts, uh, we're part of it, as well as the Bolshoi, as well as um, the Royal Shakespeare Company. I mean, there are a number of wonderful institutions. Um, and if you go to the Cultural Institute and search Martha Graham, you'll see our exhibit, um, which is going to be expanded. Uh, but it's a wonderful foundation about the Martha Graham technique and Martha Graham herself and the Martha Graham Dance Company. And you can go to the iTunes store and download it as an app as well. But there's more information online. That's so cool. I wish we had an app. And we share uh, some passion for digitizing our, our, our archives. And I was going to say, in addition to the Graham Company, we are also very fortunate in having a vast uh, archive of Martha Graham works and sketches and manuscripts and memorabilia and photographs. You can look at, at the library's website, too, and look up Martha Graham Dance Collection. Or no, just the Martha Graham Collection. And you can access these online, too. So we're very proud of that. We're very, very proud of this collaboration for this celebration. So now we want to just give you a chance to ask a couple questions and then we'll let them go back and get ready for tonight. Anybody have a question? Can you, can you hear? He, he's asking what the difference is between the Martha Graham technique and ballet. 
you know, you've got two arms, two legs, how many different things can you do to... Um, uh, but <clears throat> Martha uh, discovered as she was searching for a style of movement that would um, reveal emotion, she uh, discovered that emotion rides on the breath when you laugh or when you sob or when you're nervous. You know, it changes your breath. And she developed a, a, a style of dancing driven by the torso, her contraction being the exhale and the coiling in of the torso, and the release being the inhale and the sending out of energy. And tonight on stage, you, all of the movement in the Martha Graham works are driven by the torso. Um, this uh, core muscles. Um, she used this energy to also leverage herself against the floor and to use gravity. She wanted to show effort. She wanted to show the human condition as opposed to ballet, which was very sort of anti-gravity and you know above, above the ground. She went into the ground. And you'll see there's a series of a wonderful falls that she created that are part of the Graham technique. Tonight in Cave of the Heart, you'll see Medea as her heart is breaking, just legs opening and the whole torso drops down into the floor and then re rebounds and recovers. So it's a much more, um, shall I say, gutsy, percussive, uh, earthbound technique than ballet. Anyone else? One of the films the library showed on Saturday was the wonderful film that WQED in Pittsburgh made with Martha Graham. And I think in the introductory uh, material, it talked about the challenge to them at the time was shooting it from multiple angles with different cameras. And it dawned on me that that must have taken multiple takes and been a real challenge for the dancers, perhaps. So I was wondering, since both of you are working in film, if you could talk a little bit about about that, both what, it, what it's like for the dancers to have to go through a same piece, especially if the camera's gonna be moving or you know, shooting them from different angles. Well, th that's kind of normal for, for film work. It's, it's uh, well, either you have a lot of money and you have an A camera and a B camera and a C camera, and uh, you have somehow arranged that they are not in each other's path, so they are not filmed, that one camera doesn't film the other camera, and you try to have few takes, and that's very expensive, but you win time. Or you usually have smaller budgets, and that's you know 99% of the time true, and you have only one crew and one camera, and instead you have to do one setup, and then you have to mo move to another one and change the lens and so on. But there's enough rest in between, and it's not really a problem. I don't know about that. <laughs> I've been in a few dance films where we did it again and again, and you know, had to it's stop and prepare the tiring. needs of the costume. It's tiring, yeah. And and of course, dancers. Bob Fosse said dancers are the last soldiers of the theater because they really are disciplined and work to get something right. So. We will do take after take after take. I yes, think. but I think I think what's uh, as long as there is a clear goal, what why it's not a problem, and of course you don't destroy anyone. That's never clever, but you might have to work very hard. I'm sorry. I studied with Bill Bales, who was early Graham, and who was very swoopy. It was much more lyrical. I was at the studio in the 50s and 60s, which had become much more percussive and angular. Has the technique itself evolved as it seemed to do while she was alive? Yes, um, and she lived for such a long time that um, she set us a good example because um, the physicality of each generation keeps changing. You know, it's like the Olympics. Every few years, people break a record. The legs go higher, the jumps go higher, the turns are faster, the falls, you know. And Martha actually loved that. And we'd keep incorporating it into her classroom exercises and her choreography as she was creating new work, but also into um, the classic works. 
Uh, she didn't expect us to dance like the casts from 1947 or 1957 or 1967 had danced the works. She wanted to use our facility, and um, her the effort was she wanted to maintain the dramatic intent. She felt that that could happen, that you, you could let the legs go, that you could, you could use the facility of the contemporary dancers and yet remain true to the, the message of the work. So that's a lesson I take from Martha. Um, and of course, today's dancers are absolutely astounding. Um, the, the job is to use that in the service of the dramatic intent of the work. Anyone else? I think, yeah. oh yeah, one there, okay. Hi, uh, I was curious, the, the dance that you choreographed, did you have an idea of the dance and then apply the music to the dance or did you listen to the music and then create the dance from the music? Um, I listened to the music first. And uh, I work in many different ways, actually, I, I work in, in both of those ways and combinations of the two. And um, I didn't decide which way I would work because uh, first I did research. I didn't, I didn't even choose the music straight away. I had some pieces. In fact, I chose another piece first that I really wanted to choreograph. I think it's a beautiful piece of music, um, great for dance, called Serious Song for Strings. But then I had a problem combining it with something else. It was such a standalone piece and uh, as such it's, it was too short and so I changed my mind. But um, I think one of the challenges of, of working with Irving Fine's music is that it is particular. There is a lot of music that is popular among choreographers today that is more, um, um, is more like a landscape or an ambiance that goes on for a long time and it might, it, it's less specific. But this music is very specific. And so I found that it would be difficult for me to superimpose something up on that. It just didn't work. So then I, I decided, well, in that case, I will really work with the music and listen to it and choreograph t uh, what I hear and uh, work with it that way. So that in, in that way, it's not a conceptual piece because sometimes I do conceptual pieces and then you choose all the elements that strengthen the concept. Um, but this is not one of them. This is a musical piece. And it's also the encounter with the dancers and the encounter with the music is really the piece. Do you let the dancers contribute to the choreography? Yes. Can you explain that yes, I can explain that. <laughs> um, as a young choreographer, I was very interested in creating steps, uh, not to the point of codifying a technique or anything like that, but I was certainly interested in this is, you know, my step, which is of course um, not really true because w the patterns that you move in is, are conditioned, so they're not mine at all. But anyway, I, w I was interested in making the choices. This, this is the step, this is the phrase, this is the sequence, these are the angles, this is the, you know, all of it. And I did that for quite a long time, to the point where it, that wasn't inspiring anymore. Um, but rather I started to being more interested in seeing what can I draw out of someone else. And so then I kind of just, you know, throw a ball and then see what they do with it. And uh, from th then I start like, okay, and I saw something in what they did and I said, actually, if you just do it slightly different, go this way instead. And that way it's conversational, so I kind of uh, shape the choreography with the dancers. The strange thing is that the choreography always, well, to this point at least, turns out instantly recognizable as my choreography, even though I don't give steps anymore. <laughs> Maybe one more question yeah, over there. Uh, this is wonderful. I'm learning about Martha Graham's uh, approach and style to dance. What else will be demonstrated about her particular style in the pieces tonight? You mentioned a few other things. What else will be demonstrated? <clears throat> uh, that's peculiar, peculiar to Martha's approach. To Martha's style and her yes. vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, tonight's program, actually, because the three Graham works give you a wonderful um, 
overview of several different periods. You know, she lived so long, it's almost like Picasso. Um, and uh, uh, Appalachian Spring, of course, is from her Americana period. Um, and Dark Meadow, and these dances are fairly close together. Appalachian Spring's 44, Dark Meadow's 47, and Cave of the Heart is 46. But um, Dark Meadow is a very abstract, modernist work. Um, the, the chorus work is a very geometric and um, uh, the patterns that the dancers make on the stage uh, really harken back to experiments that she did in the early 1930s before she started using Noguchi's sets, um, experimenting with the geometry of the stage and the lines of force and drawing inspiration from a Guggenheim Fellowship she had where she traveled and, and lived in the Southwest and um, visited the rituals of the Pueblo communities there. There's a lot of the Southwest and the um, Native American ritual in several of Graham work, Graham's works, and particularly in Dark Meadow. Um, and then Cave of the Heart uh, inspired one of her wonderful Greek works by Medea. Um, again, modern. of course, she's a modernist, so the, the thing about Cave of the Heart is, is that she distilled the story into only four characters to represent this emotional battle of Medea and Jason, the princess, and the chorus. Um, so you're really getting a nice view of different approaches, different inspirations for Martha, but I do encourage you to watch for those torsos um, because really everything comes, even when a dan gram dancer lifts his or her arm, it's because the shoulder blade is dropping uh, down the back, and you're leveraging the power from the floor to lift that arm. It's never just a simple arm. I have to demonstrate one thing. I, when a baseball pitcher pitches, I, I, when I watch a baseball pitcher pitch, I see him first go into big Martha Graham contraction. <laughs> so if home plate is down there, he comes way back here, his torso's coiled, it's leveraging off the mound, and he throws the ball from the center of the planet, right? He presses away, all the energy goes all the way through the release, with the release of the torso, the, the contraction, and bam, the ball goes, right? So a, a grand dancer does not dance like this. Every movement is coming from the center of the body, from the floor. Um, so look for, they're not going to throw a ball at you, but they're throwing energy in the same <laughs> way. Wonderful. That's a great way to end. I think we're, we're about to this point of uh, going into the concert hall. Please take a look at our exhibits, by the way. We have a lot of interesting material, and thank you so much. Janet Arbor. Thank you. Thank you. you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.